Welcome to another episode of Artifacts, where our lives affect art inside out. I am your host, Jade Hassel, and today we had the pleasure of speaking with multi-career artist Vanessa Turner. Vanessa Turner is a multi-passionate multi-careerist. She is an artist, creativity coach, and engineer. Vanessa is a self-taught artist living and working on the beautiful island of Bermuda and works primarily in charcoal and pastel. She has been exhibiting professionally for a number of years and is the recipient of numerous awards. Her work is published internationally and she is represented in many private collections around the globe. Vanessa's latest solo exhibitions include Roots to Royalty in 2018 and Commonplace Beauty in 2015, which each received rave reviews. Her painting techniques stem from trial and error. Over the years, she has developed her own techniques, which primarily encompass bits and pieces of the many approaches that she has learned over time. Vanessa does not follow any particular school of thought and prefers to use painting techniques that are reliable yet fun. In her work, Vanessa paints the harmony of the Afro-Caribbean culture and mother nature. She writes her own blog and helps women go from unfulfilled hobbyists to confident professional artists as a creativity coach. It was a pleasure to be in conversation with Vanessa. If you would like to connect with her, you can find her online at vanessaturner.com or on Instagram at vanessaturnerart. Good afternoon, Vanessa. Welcome to the Artifacts Podcast. We're super excited to have you in conversation today. Thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I think it should be awesome. I think you have amazing things going on, and I'm really excited that you'll be able to share them with some of our listeners. The first question I wanted to ask you was, how has being born and raised in Bermuda inspired and informed your work? So I think um, in terms of what it is I'm drawn to share and also what draws me in, um, is seen within my artwork. So I'm heavily inspired by um, the Afro-Caribbean culture mm -hmm. in itself and the harmony that the Caribbean culture seems to have with nature. And it's a harmony that you don't see elsewhere. So for example, we're, we're heavily influenced by um, the nature around us, whether it's simply um, fruit trees or how your garden area is kept. I think it has a strong nurturing effect that ties back to centuries um, before us. I think it's in our genetics. Yes, definitely. And, and that harmony that we have to mother nature and how she nourishes us from the inside out, um, that really inspires me and how that seems to have outlasted um, significant development and changes in generation. It's always there. For, I, know, I know my artist philosophy will always be forever morphing and changing, but this time right now, that seems to be what's really um, calling me. Definitely. It's interesting, I mean, speaking about nature, because being raised in Bermuda, sometimes like when I'm there, I think I overlook it until I'm in a place like in the UK. And I think about it and I miss it so much, just like the simplicity of it, but how big of a deal it plays in our everyday being. And so it's really nice to hear that you've been able to connect nature and your work, because I think that's what art is about anyway. It's, it's about this natural a world and you know this tapping into creativity I wanted to ask you um at what point did you know that you wanted to be an artist you know what that's a that's a hard question I don't think I ever truly made that decision mm -hmm. uh, or had a point where I said okay I'm I'm an artist I think because I've always considered art such a big part of my life since childhood yeah um I don't think I've ever not been an artist, but I guess if I were to look at it, maybe if I look at it in a different way, like perhaps when did I decide to monetize my art? I would say that began for me um, the minute I finished university. And that was because the degree that I study um, is engineering. So it's everything but art. <laughs> mm -hmm, <right. laughs> so I, I missed it so much that 
it was the first thing or one of my main priorities once I graduated. I, I needed to get, bring that back into my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I've always felt like an artist. Um, I even tried to do a minor in art while I was doing a major in engineering. Yes. Um, and of course, the administration at that time looked at me like I was crazy because who does <laughs> Right. right. So they were like, um, we, we can't even facilitate that kind of a program. Um, so I think it became a, a big factor for me when my time became my own again in that mm. sense. Interesting. I'm, I'm thinking about that as well. And just like, I know that whenever it's like downtime for me and I have time to myself, that that's the first thing that I turn to as well is, is the art. Like it's always always been there for me as well yeah (laughs) just always wanting to create something I think it's the most exciting time um, that we can spend with ourselves for artists anyway Um, you had just mentioned that you're an engineer as well as an artist how have the two aligned or informed one another um I think actually I that's always a challenge for me um the two for me don't quite align at all. Um, I kind of consider them two very independent careers Mm. at this time. One is obviously very highly structured, very methodical, time dependent. Right. The other other for me is more relaxed. It's fluid. It's interpretive. Mm. Um, So, so for me, they're quite different and one seems to offer balance to the other. Perhaps, but if I even look at my approach to my art, some might say that even the way in which I start my pieces is quite methodical. So I I think both of them, to some extent, are forms of creating. One is more mathematical. You go through that process to create a solution. Um, And the other, the art form is more, for me, it's more of a a story that I'm telling. Interesting. You just also mentioned how you start your art pieces. Can you walk us through like how you begin working on a specific piece? I'd really be interested to hear how that works out for you. Sure. So I, for most of my pieces, um, they do start the same, whether it's charcoal or pastel. So I'll start with, um, I use reference photos. So I'll use the reference photo to kind of give me an idea of the the imagery Mm -hmm. um, that I want to use. But more importantly, I use the reference photo so that my scales are accurate. Right. Um, Especially when it comes to work that is figurative or involves, you know, portrait work. I'll use a scale. I'll use a scale on that reference photo to ensure that my piece is as accurate as possible. And so my work is built up in layers. So my, even my color work, it starts off as a charcoal piece. Oh, wow. Yeah. So so all of my work um, will start with charcoal. And what I do at that stage is I define the areas of dark and light. So it's almost, it almost acts like a map. I guess. Right. Um, And once that layer is on, if I am moving to color, then I start layering in the color very slowly. So I I don't even work for more than maybe two hours max at a time. Really? Yeah, I never do long stints. So I might do the the max I would do is two hours and then I might not revisit the piece for maybe another hour. Um, Sometimes that's it for the day. Right. Um, Because only for me, because I have a tendency to overwork. (laughs) Same. (laughs) Yeah. And then, you know, well, you know, once you've overworked a piece, it's hard to bring it back, right? Yes, that's true. Um, So I tend to work, um, I work quickly in that two hours. So I get a lot done. Mm -hmm. But but I try not to go past that two hour break. And then again, I'm building color um, very slowly as I go. And with with pastels, you're layering one color on top of the other. So it's a very, it's a very gentle and I like to say it's an intimate medium. Mm -hmm. I I think so. 
Yeah, you have to really guide it as you go. And because your hands are right there on the medium, um, for me, it feels a bit more like I'm more connected to it. Right. Does it feel meditative for you working in pastel? You know, over the years, I have thought about other mediums and I've tried a couple. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is that I'm really drawn to mediums where I can use my hands right. directly with the medium. So not um, brushwork, mm-hmm. I find I'm not so connected with. <clears throat> I don't really, I don't seem to enjoy it as much. Right. So it's it like that direct contact with the medium. Yeah. For some yeah. reason, that seems to have a big role in how I am. Um, how I experience the medium and what I'm able to do with it. Hmm, interesting. I've never given that even a thought. Usually I work in oil paint and so I use brushes and right. I've never, I've never really thought about like the tactility of like touching a medium or, and, or like the connection of how that would feel in using that or the effectiveness of it. So that's really interesting. Yeah. I might have to start using pesto or charcoal. <laughs> Just Give to see, again. yeah, just to see if there's like that, that connection. I um, always feel like, um, because I work in layers, I always feel like it kind of, it's pretty representative of how life can be sometimes. Mm-hmm. You go through, because my work goes through a lot of changes. If I were to show you photos of the beginning stages of a painting, yeah, it would look very strange when you see what the end product is. So, you know, that's, that's essentially our stories. Like that is everyone's story. You go mm-hmm. through a lot in life and you learn a lot of lessons and it's yes. a process before you get to where you want to be, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think that that's what's really cool though about art is that it's not necessarily about what it looks like at the final stage of it. It's like, you know, how you got there, like throughout. And I think that's why I'm really interested in... um speaking with artists and just about their processes and even visiting artist studios as well, because it's something special about seeing a work in progress. I'm more so interested in the process of the work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Rather than just the the final product. That's where all the hard work is done, right? Yeah. Underneath the surface, like what's happening underneath or what's the story or the journey behind it. I think it's fascinating. You had just mentioned about your techniques. Um, so I wanted to ask you, your, your uh, drawing techniques kind of stem from like trial and error. Can you give us a little bit more insight into this as a process practice as we're just talking about process? I'd be really interested to, to hear about your thoughts of, you know, the trial and error yeah. aspect of it. So my, my process um, that I use now, I would say it's kind of an almost like an amalgamation of styles from various mentors and other artists over the years. Mm -hmm. So the medium I'm using now was taught to me. Right. I never, I think I started using this medium in 2010. So yeah, about 10 years now. Wow. Time flies. (laughs) I've been doing it for 10 years now. And prior to that, I was using, um, graphite pencil primarily and over time um, using the medium over time you learn and with any medium you learn what does and doesn't work for you so you learn the limitations of your medium right and you know the guidance of others coupled with my own independent experimentation I slowly developed a process that worked for me and it, it's still ongoing and I think it's always going to be right a, a work in progress because you know once you master something by the time you've mastered that your eyes are already on the next thing yes so, <laughs> definitely so it's, it's always you know you're always experimenting um but definitely what I do today is definitely um from what I've developed from other artists and through experimentation. Mm-hmm. So you've yeah. like com- compiled like what you've been taught and then also like what you have naturally experienced and developed like on your own yeah. and kind of like so, morphed it into your own practice. 
Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, interestingly, I initially started out kind of like as self-taught. I'm in a master's program now. But I wanted to ask you for artists who are self-taught, what's some advice that you could give to some artists who are self-taught, who are interested in maybe moving from just working on their own and you know figuring things out and experimentation to kind of moving into taking it a little bit more serious? So kind of like from hobbyist to a professional? Uh, so at the moment, um, I do what's called creative coaching mm-hmm. with quite a few artists. Um, I don't, I haven't yet worked with local artists, but I've been doing it a lot with artists overseas. Right. And what initially drew me into this is because I'm a self-taught artist as well, other than courses that I would have taken here and there and, you know, through professional development initiatives, I've never done any formal training in art. Right. And I think for many artists that can be intimidating yes and they kind of either they already have the determination and fortitude to press through that or that could be the line that they draw where they say this is just not for me right um and i think a lot of people have put their passions aside because they don't see a way in which they can succeed as self-taught artists so it's funny you should ask that because i actually have a guide that I published earlier um, this month. Yes. And it's called, it's called How to Succeed as a Self-Taught Artist. And um, in that guide, um, I talk about the importance of believing in yourself firstly. Yes, um, that's like number one. <laughs> it is, because yeah. if, if you can't do that and see the importance of what you do, even if it's just for yourself, Yes. Um, you know, anything that you do after that is just going to be futile. It's, it's important that you really and truly believe in yourself and that there is a need for what you have to offer, mm. right? Mm. Whether that need, again, is a need that others have or just you that you, you yourself have, you're fulfilling a need for yourself. Yes. Um, the other thing that it's important if you're a self-taught artist is building your knowledge and skill set. So, you know, whether for someone that looks like doing a couple online classes or maybe going to your local galleries and doing a couple classes that they offer, or whether that's even just through freestyle experimentation, it's, Mm -hmm. it's important that you build upon what you already know. Yeah. So just keep you, you know, so you keep advancing. And the other one, number three, I always say is find your tribe. Yes so, to that one. <laughs> yeah, find That's that important. group. It is. Find that group that really um, inspires you, pushes you, and supports you. That's important. Um, and you know, when you work as artists, it, it can be, I don't like to use the word lonely, but we, we work in solitude. Yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. And, and that is an important factor in our work. Um, I find it hard to work with a whole lot going around, like going on around me. Same. Um, if, <laughs> like if I have to interact with people and work at the same time, it, it doesn't quite work for me. Yeah, so, I, I feel distracted and um, not as connected with the work. Yeah. If, yeah. And so we spend so many hours in that zone. I think that when we come out of that, it's important that we reconnect with our tribe, whoever that is. Yes. Because that's where we find that support to go back to the easel again and keep going, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And like get the inspiration and also the energy too from, because sometimes like we can feed off the energy from other people and you know, that's inspiring, like the connection, like I'm already inspired just talking to you. I'm already oh. ready to pull out some pastels and, and get going and try and yeah. have this conversation. So yeah, connecting with people is, is definitely extremely important. Um, yeah. That's amazing. So you just mentioned your guide. Um, th- this is available on your website. Yeah. So we talked about um, the th- like three of the six steps just now. So there's six in total. And the guide is available on my website. It's a free download. Awesome. Um, there's no cost. 
And in the back of the guide, I actually have a small worksheet because above all, I don't want artists, what I truly don't want is for artists to simply read it, say, yes, this is great, and then put it aside. Right. Like I've developed it in, in hopes that it will truly help artists. So mm-hmm. in the back, there is a worksheet that helps artists to actually work through the six steps and make commitments and promises to themselves. Right. And then I ask that they send that to me because once they've done that, I can kind of help them keep accountable to themselves. Right. You know, just to give you that extra oomph to keep going. Yeah. Like kind of like an accountability partner to keep you motivated um, to keep going. Yeah, definitely. That's amazing. So we can share the link um, in the description box oh. Yeah, below for people to be able to um, visit your site and to grab that because that would be an amazing resource for people to be able to use. Um, that's incredible. Um, you, you had also just mentioned about like some of the artists that you've learned from. Who are some of your biggest artist influences that you're inspired by? Uh, So my medium, um, when I started it 10 years ago, it was introduced to me by Sharon Wilson. I love Miss Wilson. (laughs) I love her work. Yes. That same frustration that you experienced um, when you started Pastels. Yes. I understand it because that is what she had to work through with me. Right. (laughs) There were plenty times when I said, you know, I hate this. This isn't working. I'm not getting the colors that I want. Right. Uh, but again, so it was a process. And I just found um, working with her amazing, not just for the technical side of art, mm-hmm. um, but more, more importantly, she really pushed me as an artist to um, figure out what my voice is. What is it that my work has to say? Right. Um, how do I want to convey that? Who is my work for? Um, so that was really important um, to me. And that's something I've always um, taken away from my time with her. Right. Always circling back to, okay, well, it's a story. And what is it that my story is sharing? And who is it, you know, who needs to hear this story? Mm, that's, yeah, that's extremely important. I'm thinking about some of the conversations I've had with her as well. And she also helped me to just come to the bottom line of like, you know, who is my audience? Like, who am I trying to communicate with? And that was such a great tool and that I've been able to grasp and carry with me as I move forward, like with, you know, more things that I'm doing. Um, So that's extremely important. So like having a mentor, um, can you speak a little bit about like how, the importance of having a mentor when you're deciding that you want to pursue your artistic career? Yeah, that is, that is a huge one, especially when you are, I would say, in the first 10 to 15 years of your career. Yes, there is a lot of value in learning everything on your own. There, there is value in that. However, Um, I believe there's greater value in benefiting from the experiences of others that have done this before us. So it's, I think it's important that you find someone that you connect well with, um, that doesn't mind putting in that extra time and energy with you to, Mm -hmm. to help you along your journey and determine what, what is your path in this industry? Mm -hmm. You know, what does your path look like and how can you, how can you define success on your own terms? Right. Um, Yeah. So I think those who have walked this journey before us have a lot to offer and and often um, because as artists, because we work so independently, that's something we might not always uh, value immediately, but it's definitely something that we should always, I guess, have in our back pocket. You should always have somebody that you know, okay, they've done this before. You know, right. what, foundation, what foundation can I at least lay based off of their guidance? Right. And then, you know, that I can build on. Yeah, definitely. And I think that also connects back with what you were 
uh, mentioning in terms of like um, having a tribe, like the your mentor could also be a part of your tribe as well, like just being able yeah. to connect. You mentioned, um, you had asked as well, like what other artists um, I've been heavily inspired by. Mm -hmm. And lately, um, I'm sure you know her name, Bisa Butler. I know oh, you. Oh, I love Bisa Butler. <laughs> yes, Bisa her Bisa work is incredible. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So um, I love the amount of color and the vibrance of her pieces. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that she's doing, you know, the medium that she's working in, she's, she's quilting, like she's sewing yeah. these pieces. Um, it's fantastic. Like when yeah. I see, I couldn't believe that it was in paint. Right. Like she and, even yeah. gets the shadows and like uses like a thin layer of like mesh to form the shadows. Oh, it's exactly. incredible. Yeah. It is. So um, Bisa's work, I'm a huge fan of. Um, and a couple other artists, Taha Clayton, um, Chris Clark. Yeah, Chris is out of Florida. And then um, another smaller, I wouldn't say smaller, but an artist who's probably not as well known, but uh, we tend to have um, similar styles and interests. So for her, it's more so that um, I see what she's doing. I appreciate it and I understand it. And I think that we're both telling similar stories together. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Brenda Brudit. Yeah. I'll have and to check her so out those, as well. Yeah, she's based in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, there's a few artists. And honestly, every day, I think I discover more on Instagram. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are so many artists out there doing amazing work. So yeah, absolutely. And I spend a lot of time too, like researching other artists. I love to see like what people are working on. Um, I think that's a part of my artistic process too is you know just being I guess like informed of like you know what people are making because I think art gives rise to art and so when I see yeah. other people making like it's super inspiring you know just to to see what's happening out there because when you get stuck in your studio you know it's just you and you you know you have your own you know intentions and what you want to make but it's also really nice to see other people's work too like you can kind of feel like okay I'm not in this alone like there's someone else over there somewhere in their studio alone also making work <laughs> yeah so yeah and then what they're doing might inspire you to experiment with another side of your work yeah definitely you know it's a, it's like a language that we all share back and forth but it's it's visual mm -hmm. yeah and intranslatable like beyond language um yeah that's why i love i love art so much um i i wanted to ask you because you're multi-passionate you know you're an engineer you're a creativity coach you're also a mom i wanted to ask you how do you navigate these multiple interests and different roles in your life and how do you balance your career? So for me, that's always a loaded question because mm -hmm. I, I don't know if we ever truly find balance. Right. Um, I think that's, it's always a juggling act, but um, what has been important for me over the years is um, not so much what they call like work-life balance because I find you can't just turn one side of your brain or interest off right. after a certain hour and then switch to something else. I've always found that for me, that didn't work. So I use what I guess some would call work-life integration. Right. <laughs> so, so I've tried to keep, um, well, I've been fortunate where I can keep my schedule relatively flexible. Nice. So Yes, I do. Um, like right now, I do own and manage um, an engineering firm along with others. And the engineering industry, yes, it is demanding, but I'm able to manage my schedule in a way that I'm not necessarily at a desk or working the typical nine to five. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my work, but in a way that's more manageable for me so that the other interests that I have in life can fit in during mm -hmm. the day too, whether that be, you know, maybe perhaps tomorrow I'll take a half day to, to paint and 
you know, just get a couple new pieces um, gritted out perhaps or something like that. Or right. maybe I'll take, you know, maybe in the afternoon, I'll do a few coaching calls. I try to keep my schedule relatively flexible um, so that I can integrate my, all of my interests in my day. Of course, it doesn't always work out perfectly. Of course not. But that, that's the practice that has worked for me over time. So I've tried to make decisions that support that. And I've always found too, for women in particular, um, that's always a struggle. So yeah. you may have um, a mom who's always had an interest in art, but she works a nine to five. Maybe she's even a nurse and she does night shifts. And she has, you know, she has children, she has responsibilities at home. You know, how on earth can she fit in her passion for art? Right. Uh, so in particular, that's one of the areas that I work with um, women to help them find that system that works for them. Because it doesn't look the same for everyone. Um, yeah. So I, I find that that's always the best place to start. Like, okay, well, what is on your table right now? And what is it that you really want to do? Because if, you don't, if you're not fulfilling in life what you're passionate about, it doesn't matter how many other things you add in there. You're never going to feel as fulfilled as you could potentially feel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we try to work on, on that in particular. So I find with women, that's always a difficult one. Yeah, definitely. So you help women in, in this regard with your creativity coaching. Yeah, so I only work with um, women and I specifically did that because I feel most connected with women in that sense. I know exactly what it is um, they're struggling with. I know what it is they're looking to achieve. Um, and that's because I've been there. I've been that mom that stopped painting for three years because she just never had time, never right. touched a single paper canvas in, you know, and eventually, wow. you know, that your medium does not stop calling you. It, the call keeps getting louder yes. and louder. <laughs> so Definitely. Where you, yeah. You just can't take it anymore. You're like, okay, something has to give. I, I need to find a way to get back to that. Um, so how did you so make that transition? Like from, you know, taking a three-year hiatus. Um, I took, same for me, I also took a five-year hiatus and then eventually I was just like, I can't anymore, I have to. How did you yeah. navigate from not working as much because you were saying you didn't have time to, to then making the decision and stepping into your purpose? So my, um, when I stopped painting, that was not too long after having my daughter and just trying to balance um, being new to motherhood, what does motherhood look like for me? You know, oh, now I don't get to sleep anymore. <laughs> right. My time is no longer my own. Um, and yes, that does happen, but I think women can um, manage it in healthy ways. Right. I think we often do it in ways that are unhealthy to ourselves um, mm -hmm. and it's subconscious because you're just trying to fulfill these responsibilities but not realizing that you're not taking care of yourself right um, right in the process so yeah I, for me I've always been um, I know what that feels like um, I know the frustration mm -hmm. and I think it's important that uh, women always women artists always have that connection to their work. Again, it's going to look different to everyone. You may not, yeah. you may not paint every day. You may only paint every other day or maybe even just on weekends, but whatever it is works that works for you. Mm -hmm. um, I try to get women to find that what works for you right now. Let's, let's focus on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so working on your purpose, like I'm sure you've learned so much over the years. Um, you know, just from navigating and kind of like, it's interesting because I'm thinking about this as you're as speaking, like our identities are so like fluid, like we're not just like this one thing, like we're multifaceted. And I'm sure you've learned a lot, like being able to be whole and be a mom, be an engineer, be an artist, be a coach, 
Um, so I'm sure you've learned a lot. So what are some of the, the lessons that working in your medium has taught you? Just a pure connection of like working with your specific medium. So like pastel or charcoal. Oh, okay. So the biggest lesson for me, I would say is um, everything won't be a masterpiece. And that for me was probably the hardest one because, you know, as artists, we put in so much time and energy into our work, right? right? We, we could be um, working on a piece for up to a month. Yeah. And if at, the, if at the end of that process, you are unhappy with what you see, it can feel very defeating. Yes. Because you're looking at, okay, I just wasted, well, this is what you're saying to yourself. I just wasted all that time, mm -hmm. you know, all that energy. And then you start looking about the materials that you feel you've wasted and how much they cost. Right. Um, <laughs> Art materials are thinking, not cheap. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, but I think what's, what became, or what I learned over time is that on pieces like that in particular, um, they probably are serving a greater purpose where, no, it, it's not what I envisioned in the end. And mm -hmm. perhaps it's not a piece that I like and no one will ever see it, but right. um, perhaps it taught me a bigger lesson about maybe patience or composition or how right. I applied my materials. Um, there's a, there was likely a lesson in there which makes the following pieces that come after it far more successful right and, and um you know makes that process more beneficial now because i've learned another lesson and so that was probably the biggest one for me yeah yeah for sure and i'm i'm also thinking too about us as artists like we kind of let go of this idea of perfectionism like there's so much potential in like how our pieces are interconnected and how like this piece leads to this piece um and so there there is lots of potential to be able to take away like many different life lessons from from our practices for yeah, sure yeah i had um i had written a blog piece some time back about um the six lessons that your medium is teaching you that you may be ignoring for artists and the like number one what i had mentioned was everything won't be a masterpiece right um, number two was patience is mandatory. Yes. <laughs> uh, because, you know, again, we have in our mind what we want the finished product to be, but we're starting with a blank canvas. Yeah. And we have to remember, okay, it's a process Yeah. until we get there. As much as we want it and how badly we want that finished piece, we can't, we can't race it. Um, number three I had was gratitude keeps you in the game. That's um, a good one. I love that yeah. one. So being appreciative for, it's really important, I think, for us to look at as artists how much we've grown and how far we've come over mm -hmm. our time. Because artists, even over a one, a one year span, you can see significant growth in your work. Yeah. Um, so I got into the habit of not throwing away those pieces that I hated. Um, and keeping them and looking back at them a year later. Yeah, just and, as a reminder and, of how far you've come. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the frustrations that you might feel now, you look back and you'll say, oh, wait, but I've, I've done so much since then. My style has grown. My right. techniques I've better mastered. Um, so I always say gratitude keeps you in the game. Um, number four, I say comparison is a thief. Um, the thief of joy yes and that comes yeah i think that comes big with social media nowadays too that's true um, i find um it's easy for artists to compare themselves to each other especially perhaps there's an artist you admire um you can get into a bad habit of comparing your work um but we all have to recognize that we all have a unique story and, and a unique style and everyone has their role or place in this world it doesn't you don't have to have you don't have to define success by someone else's style or standard yes yes that's so important yeah and then number five I had was 
um, stop fighting what you can't change. So there you might find with your medium, um, there are certain things you just can't, you can't do with it. It's just not, right. the medium itself is just not capable of doing yeah. that. So instead of fighting with the medium, um, for example, like perhaps I really want to apply pastel to canvas. It, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. Right. Right. But, it has its limitations. Uh, perhaps, yeah. But perhaps that's, you know, maybe there's a different risk to it. Maybe if I applied something else first and then I put the pastel on top, right. it could work. So I always say, you know, stop fighting what you can't change and take risk instead. So you don't get caught in that, in that rut of frustration. Right. And then, my last one was sensitivity is a gift, not a curse. Yes. Um, These are good ones. Yeah, I'm going to put think, this up on my wall. <laughs> I think um, naturally artists, we are quite sensitive. And I think that's what allows us to be artists. Yeah. You know, we're, we're more in tune with, with the experiences that we have. Yeah. I definitely. think than the average person and that's what yeah that's what allows us to to feel and interpret the way that we do mm -hmm. um, but at the same time because we're we tend to be a bit more sensitive um you know that can seem like a disadvantage in terms of how our you know how we react when our work is not perceived in the way that we might want it to right um maybe when we're experiencing some frustration, um, it's, it's easy for us to be thrown off mm -hmm. because we're sensitive. Yeah. So I think instead of um, artists always trying to be a bit tougher, um, we should actually just embrace that sensitivity and recognize, yeah. okay, well, these are some of the things that come with it, but the sensitivity, is, it's necessary. Yeah. And for us to just like lean into that and not yeah. really reject it yeah for sure I think those are amazing tips I'm going to visit your blog <laughs> and probably print mm -hmm. out a, a copy of it and just put it on my wall because I mean I think that's a great reminder and also too like the reason why you're making for me that's also really helpful too just to have in the back of my mind like why am I doing it or why did I begin yeah your why yeah yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about an exhibition that you had two years ago, your Roots to Royalty exhibition. Can you share a little bit about some of the inspiration behind some of the pieces you had in the show? Sure. So when I started um, my work for that piece, um, that was when my, I would say my artist philosophy, my story as to why I paint um, started changing. Mm. So, so initially, my, my why was centered around um, beauty that's found in the commonplace. Right. So right. I found sim very simple things, um, beautiful, but yet not appreciated or ignored. So previously, I focused heavily on still life. Right. And just showing, again... Right the beauty found in the common place. But eventually that started changing um, and I became more drawn to uh, what we discussed earlier, the harmony between um, the Afro-Caribbean culture and mother nature. Right. And I, I think that first started for me when the Afro-punk movement um, mm. began getting more more cover like you began hearing about it more yeah. and I mean as soon as I saw it you know I almost felt like a little obsessed <laughs> with it and this yeah this the movement the energy the style of yeah. it and so awesome so vibrant yeah I also loved it as well yeah it just felt like yeah it felt like modern culture um reconnecting to its roots mm. And, and bringing that connection along with it in style and fashion. Yes. Um, so I began exploring how, how our traditions have been carried forth in fashion, um, but, and those traditions also stemming from our ties 
to Mother Nature. Mm. So I think it's a story that I'm I'm still exploring and figuring out how to tell it. Right. It's a story that's probably going to be with me for a couple more years, really. Yeah. Uh, to keep working through, but so that that exhibition is is probably a display of the start of that journey. Okay. Yeah. So you're still in this process of, you know, developing this idea of this connection between Afro-Caribbean culture and beauty and like natural beauty in Mother Nature. I'm working on another collection now behind the scenes, which is almost pretty much an extension of of that exhibit. So I'm hoping to have those pieces maybe by late fall. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've been doing that in the background and furthering that you know that story yeah that's exciting I can't wait to see those I'm sure they will be awesome um I've seen some of the the pictures that you sent me and um I think some of those ones were from this Roots to Royalty exhibition that you had some of the images that you yes. sent by email and then one of them was one of them I'm entering into the emancipation exhibition that Society of Arts has coming up in August Oh, that's amazing. So it's, it feels, I feel very connected to, um, to this story and how I can, how I can bring it forth. I'll be really interested to see how those pieces manifest and how they show up. So that's amazing. On your website, you have created a free guide um, on how art collectors can start collecting work for $500 or less, which I think is super awesome. And th- I'm sure there are many people who would be interested in hearing a little bit about your ideas on how they can, you know, start collecting, but don't really know where or, you know, how to maneuver, or how to get started. Can you share a little bit of the tips that you have for some of the people who may be interested in that? Yeah. So I started that guide um, because I was so blown away by the number of people that either didn't have any art in their home at all right, or had art that they had no connection to. Right. Um, so maybe it was just a, a $10 poster that they saw on Overstock or something. Um, and I, I found that um, I found that surprising because your home, I think, or wherever you spend a lot of time, um, that place becomes quite sacred. Yes. And and I think we need to be mindful of how we or in what way we transform our spaces. And I found that it's not it's not a lack of interest um, in the art itself, but ultimately what prevented people from really exploring fine art is that they thought it wasn't for them. Right, exactly. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people would, they'd love to own original art. Um, They would love to own something that's one of a kind or something that few to none have. Yeah. Um, but, But they might find the whole concept of buying fine art either overwhelming or confusing. And I think in that sense, the art industry has done a disservice to the average person because you think of fine art as, again, something that's only for the wealthy. You think of it as only being for those who want to spend their weekends browsing art galleries, you know, but their art is for everyone yeah, and absolutely. I think I think it's possible for people to buy art on their own financial terms it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be a two thousand dollar painting yeah you, you don't have to spend that to have art that you feel connected with mm-hmm. in your space so um, I developed this guide for people who who have hesitated on um, purchasing art because of price and cost. So um, yeah. I, I believe you can. For less than $500, you could have a small gallery of work in your home. Yeah, um, definitely. It, it's possible. So 
um, in this guide, I've talked about um, budgeting, how to start slowly so that, so that you're not buying junk, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, how to make sure you're not limiting your sources because there are plenty places to buy art. You know, it's the art gallery is not the only place. Yeah. Um, the secret to limited edition prints. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have an artist that's only doing 15 prints, I mean, those prints are going to spike in value Yeah. because, you know, usually some artists might even do up to a hundred prints, but if you have artists doing very small collections, yeah, um, you know, you could have your art collection can essentially become an asset at very little cost to you. Right. Definitely. Uh, and then I think it's important that people know that you can negotiate um, with artists. Mm-hmm. There are terms, there are terms under which you can negotiate. Maybe they have, work from older collections yes you know that they are willing to sell to you at a lower price point than their latest collection yeah definitely Uh, there are yeah it's doable and i just think Mm -hmm. people need to know that they have options and it is possible yeah i'm just thinking about that and i actually um had a lady who was really interested in one of my paintings and she said that she wanted to have it but that she just couldn't afford to pay the total amount right at that moment. And so we worked out a um, payment plan and, um, you know, she paid for it like monthly. And then, you know, over the course of six months, she had paid it off and then it was hers to own. And so that's what's also, you know, it's, it's options and there, there are ways that people can enter. Um, Yeah. And see, she was able to do it on terms that worked for her. So yeah. Yeah. It works for both parties, you as the artist and as her as a collector. And she'll likely be back because yeah. it was a good experience for her. Yeah, definitely. Like um, mutually beneficial for sure. So I'll also share a link to your site so people can also have a look at that as well because I think that that's extremely useful. So thank you for doing that. I think some of the things that you're sharing on your blog are really awesome, not just for artists, but, you know, for collectors as well. It, like the, the tips and the resources are um, really great. So thank you uh, for doing that. I, I think it's really amazing. I wanted to ask you uh, quickly before we wrap up, like what's next for you? Um, you know, what do you have going on? Like maybe for the rest of the year, upwards until like 2021, do you have anything on the calendar? Um, I'm looking forward to the local galleries um, opening back up so I can, I can put um, some more work out there that's available, you know, for people to actually see firsthand. Yeah. I am grateful and happy to say that by the end of the month, um, people will also be able to purchase my work directly from my site. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Or that's yeah. That's been a work in that's been a work in progress, and I have um, Stephen Johnston of SJD World to thank mm-hmm. for that. He's been um, facilitating that for me. Yes. Um, I've also been um, for the past year. I've been working hard to get my work overseas. Yes. So so right now I have a gallery um, that carries my work in New Jersey. Um, Mm -hmm. They're called Aquaba Gallery. And over the pandemic, so this is one of the advantages I was speaking of, over the pandemic, because I had a lot more time, Yeah, um, I began scouting New York galleries to try get my work um, in New York City itself. And um, I was able to secure a gallery in just right in the middle of Harlem amazing Um, that's incredible so that's kente royal gallery yes so i'm going to be sending um some work to them um probably early fall i would say amazing Um, yeah it's it's a work in progress but again this is these are one of the things i talk about too with other artists you just gotta try go for it yes and, and see what happens you'll be told no a lot but you just keep going keep going um, yes i'm hoping to next find 
locations in Atlanta and Toronto. I think those and are then, great hubs. For yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then on the coaching side, I will be doing what I call um, mini sessions. So free, they're free, 15 minute mini sessions um, nice. for women artists who feel really stuck and just need um, someone to talk through maybe a challenge that they're having. Yes. Uh, maybe they're just not sure if this is working for them, what's their next step. Mm -hmm. So I'll be doing free uh, mini sessions in August for women. Awesome. So people can access this on your website as well? Yeah, my mini sessions I haven't even um, announced yet. So okay. that's coming. They'll see it eventually. But okay. of course, if anyone, hears, if anyone hears this and wants to jump the gun, be sh you know, by all means, email me and right. they'll, be first, they'll be first in the door. Okay, um, awesome. That's something I'm looking forward um, to doing for people. And I think especially given the circumstances right now. Yes. I think people need something positive to, to just jumpstart them again if they need it. Yeah, absolutely. Especially considering the climate. Some people may need like a little boost, a little motivation. So it's awesome that you're offering that for free for people to be able to help out and, you know, get them get them going. Um, so that's amazing. Vanessa, this has been incredible and very insightful. And I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Before we end, I just wanted to quickly ask you um, where our listeners can find you online. So my website is vanessaturner.com. Mm -hmm. um, so, and on my website, I I do update it frequently. Um, they can find my updated and recent blog post on there. Mm -hmm. And I'm also um, very present and engaged on my Instagram profile, yes. which is Vanessa Turner Art. Um, those are my two main platforms. You can also find me on Facebook under Vanessa Turner um, Artist and Creativity Coach. Okay, awesome. Thank you so, so much, Vanessa. This has been Thank incredible. I really enjoyed our conversation. And I think that people will be able to get Thank you so much yeah. for the opportunity. Yes, of course. I think it's, it's amazing what you're doing. Think, before I go, I have to say, um, I love your work as well. Um, oh, thank you. I especially love your Charmin piece. Oh, thank you so much. I, so I that, appreciate that. Your Charmin piece. And then you had an exhibition at BSOA, which was where oh, I first- Oh, yes, last yeah, that year. Was, that's where I first saw your work in person. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Oh, and yeah. then you do a lot of work with um, kids. I don't know, are you doing it this year, the summer day camp program? You did it last year. I did it last year. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to do it this year because oh. I didn't come back home. Your work with the young ones was beautiful. Oh, thank you. I loved it. The, the kids inspire me so much. At the root and at the core of my work is just me being a kid, <laughs> you know, just creating yeah. the stuff that I wish that I had seen being made, what my collages are about. So thank you yeah, so, so variety, much. Right? Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate that. Thank you, Vanessa. I'll share all of the links and everything um, for everybody to be able to access below. Um, this has been incredible and wishing you all the best in the future. Thank you, take care. Thank you, you too. Please share with friends, subscribe, and rate us on iTunes. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us online at theartifacts.com and on Instagram at theartifacts. If you'd like to send us a message or to suggest an artist that you'd like to see on the show, please connect with us at theartifacts at gmail.com. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you our upcoming episodes. Peace and blessings. This recording is copyrighted by Jude Hassel, and all rights are reserved.